good morning everyone and welcome to the fourth session of Net Zero Live 2022. I am Holly Tai, Specification Editor at Assemble Media Group and our topic for this session is specifying for Part L. Updates to approved Document L or Part L of the Building Regulations for England came into force on the 15th of June 2022. The updated regulations aim to lower the operational carbon emissions of new homes, raise fabric efficiency standards and introduce a new level of quality control. As such, specifying materials and products to meet the new standards has become a top priority over the past six months. In this session, we're going to hear from a panel of experts as they outline what the fabric requirements are, explain the specification responsibilities from a Part L perspective and how decisions can impact compliance. The panel will also discuss which specification decisions can have the biggest impact on energy efficiency and what the cost implications and benefits are, both during the build and post-occupancy. Our panel today is David Adams, Strategic Adam, strategic Advisor sorry, at the Future Homes Hub, Lydia Guerra, Senior Engineer at Max Fordham, and Claire Young, who is the Senior Engineer at Civic Engineers. Once we've heard from our speakers, there will be time at the end for questions, so please do submit your questions throughout. And also, I just want to flag that this session um, and all of our other Net Zero Live sessions are available free on demand for 12 months via the same link that you joined by today. So if you want to rewatch or share with someone else that you think would enjoy the session, then please do. Without further ado, I'm going to pass over to our first speaker, David, over to you. Thank you very much. And hopefully the slides can be seen. Yes, uh, all good, David. Okay, great. What I can't see is any controls for them. Has that gone? Ah, got them now. Apologies, folks. Uh, well, thank you for uh, for inviting me uh, to this session. So I'm David Adams. Uh, I work for the Future Homes Hub, and the Future Homes Hub is supporting the wider house building industry. Um, uh, transition towards and beyond the Future Home Standard 2025. So I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction to the uh, Part L uh, uh, and indeed the Part L. Come on, go. There we go. In the arrival of FLOSS, Part F, L, O and S, because they really do need to be uh, uh, considered in the context of all three or all four or certainly the first three in particular. Emerging themes. Let me take you through some of the emerging themes that we've been uh, identifying and working with house builders and the industry generally. Things to keep in mind before colleagues on the call will go through more detail uh, on each of these. When? Well, it's it's happened. We're in, as you're, I'm sure, aware. The uh, uh, it was interest, introduced in June 2022, and there's a 12-month transition. So, if uh, uh, you got a building notice prior to June, then you're in good shape. Um, but you need to have started on site prior to June 2023, otherwise the new regs will apply. So this is a significant difference in the transitional arrangements compared with the regulations last time in 2013. So this is something that um, uh, I'm concerned, particularly smaller uh, house builders uh, and those uh, uh, providing support to the smaller sector of the uh, industry uh, may not be recognising, uh, and it's a, a really important one, otherwise people could get caught. Right at the beginning of a Part L presentation, uh, probably might sound a bit to, odd to talk about Part O, but Part O is really important in this, uh, uh, in this change. Part O is a new regulation that's come in, so people are absolutely unfamiliar with it. It's uh, to uh, uh, help prevent homes, both now and into the future, uh, overheat, prevent that overheating. Um, but it impacts lots of different aspects of the design of the dwelling. Sill heights on upper floors, for instance, those sill heights have increased. There are more openable windows. 
we need to reduce the, the uh, solar gain. So that may be smaller windows or certainly smaller on some facades or indeed the in incorporating shading. And finally, more active measures to uh, reduce the excess heat through um, air conditioning, et cetera, et cetera, as a fallback option. So part O is really important to consider before we get into part L because it will change the design. And if you've done it in the opposite way, you may well find yourself repeating a lot of those part L considerations. Colleagues are gonna <coughs> be talking about this, I'm sure in more detail, but clearly walls, floors, maybe uh, uh, roof insulation as well is likely to be thicker. Certainly from a dwelling's perspective, if you're building 100 mil cavity walls, um, whilst it's not impossible to get those to pass, you have to work very hard. And certainly it's expected that most cavity walls will move probably to 150 mil wide, might be 125. So this obviously is a significant shift in terms of the uh, uh, design of the dwelling bases, plotting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so one to be very much alert to. Another big change in 2021 Part L is the emphasis that's going to be absolutely required on construction details, those thermal bridges, those corners, edges, round windows, doors, etc. In the past, defaults have been able to use and an a fairly generic approach. Uh, this time, that's not going to cut it. Each of those thermal bridges will need to be specified and built on site to those drawings because there is an element of photographing what you've built before it all gets covered up as part of the uh, building reg compliance process. So not only is there a new emphasis on bridges, but there is a follow-on QA process that demonstrates that those uh, assumptions that have been put into the um, energy model at the beginning have been undertaken on site. And bearing in mind that has so many implications to it, which I'm sure are not lost on you, um, this is a significant shift in uh, 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 practice, both design, site and QA. Really important one. As we move to lower and lower energy buildings, it's really important to, to uh, address thermal bridging, and that's come in now in Part L 2021. Linked to that is be careful, therefore, with complex forms, because complex forms, the thermal bridging would need to be calculated if it's extensive. Um, and the uh, consequence of that is um, uh, you're both doing particular calculations if there aren't standard ones available for you and you've got to make sure it's built on correctly on site because it may have to be photographed. New services and renewables, almost certain for low, most low row housing it will have a PV on it or indeed it could have a heat pump instead of a gas boiler um, and therefore it may not require the uh, uh, solar panels. Um, but even if you're using a gas boiler, as you are now, and you'll go for the PV route, um, the flow temperatures to radiators has been reduced down to 55 degrees. This is a big change. The radiator sizing has will, will go up by about 50% compared with um, 2013 si uh, radiator sizes. So one to be aware of uh, and not to get caught out with. Enhanced ventilation strategies at this stage, 2021, expecting a, a, a bit of a shift. Trickle vents in a natural ventilated dwelling uh, are twice the size. And um, uh, if you are um, moving away from intermittent extract fans, then to continuously running extraction, uh, the trickle vents can be the same size as 2013. And that seems to be a direction a lot of house builders are going. And I mentioned about the photographs, but also key elements of the specification that's been used in the energy modeling is now provided to the home purchaser. So the home purchaser is able to look at um, the high level assumptions that have been made about the home that they're buying. And clearly 
If that's important, therefore, it absolutely does follow that those um, uh, elements are undertaken on site. So that's a quick whistle stop tour through some of the high level changes, things that might catch you out. Um, Colleagues following will get into a bit more detail, I'm sure, but just to say there is some help and guidance available. Future Homes Hub have produced some. Clearly, there's a lot in magazines as well, um, but we produced a couple of guides on Part L. This isn't how to do it. It's not a how-to guide. It's a where to start guide, and it touches on a number of the points uh, that I've just made, but obviously in more detail, gives some helpful tables for that starting point. But I'm going to finish a Part L presentation talking about Part O because this is probably the one we're most concerned people are missing. Really important to get that Part O um, uh, consideration done first prior to things going into planning because it could affect planning. And certainly there will be changes uh, compared with what you, you used to build back in uh, to the 2013 regs. Real key one. Thank you very much, and I'll be passing across to Lydia. Morning, everyone. Um, hope you can all see my screen. Um, I cannot see you, so I <laughs> um, hope it's all good. So, um, yes, so following on from what uh, David just said, um, Okay. Um, okay. Apologies. Um, and by the way, the Future Homes Hub guidance is really useful. I have looked at it for part of. Please go to the website and have a look at it. It's great stuff. Um, so, kind of uh, touching on some things that um, have already been mentioned, but maybe going a bit more into details of the kind of uh, building services and energy side. Um, so a little introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Lydia Guerra and I am a senior engineer and sustainability consultant at Max Fordham. I work in the London office, so I do quite a lot of projects in London. Uh, Max Fordham was uh, created more than 50 years ago by Max as a building services uh, consultancy, but over time we've expanded um, as a company and also in the services we offer and we do lots of planning guidance, building physics, uh, sustainability consultancy and so on. So I'll briefly touch about the um, latest approved document L, which we all call Part L, uh, 2021, Volume 1 and 2, uh, some of the key changes uh, and early lessons learned from modeling with this um, new Part L, and then also a case study example of a project that we are modeling at the moment, um, and it's in London, so we have to follow the London plan. <clears throat> so as already mentioned, and as you all now know, there is a new edition of the approved document L. Um, it's now um, split into two volumes, volume one for dwellings, and volume two for all buildings other than dwellings. Um, there are some changes that kind of um, are um, applied in both volumes. Um, it has mentioned, it has been mentioned before. The notional building now has an improved fabric, um, and the thermal bridging penalty has increased. So, really, the default value now um, is giving you uh, something around 15% penalty, both in volume one and two, compared to the notional. <clears throat> so, really, really important to think about those thermal bridging details early. Also, the notional building now has got photovoltaic panels on the roof. Um, so that's, kind of, that's included, the renewable energy production is included in the baseline case. Also, another um, really important thing for the kind of carbon emission aspect is the um, carbon content of the grid. So the energy grid has a carbon factor, which in uh, it relates to the carbon content of the generation of this energy. So the gas carbon doesn't change. It's been uh, 210 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour um, for many editions of the building regulations, while the electricity carbon factor has been steadily declining. Uh, just think that uh, it used to be 519 and um, 
it's now down to 136 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So for the first time in the in Partel, the electricity carbon factor is now lower than gas, which uh, means if you're using heat pumps, if you're using electrical systems in your building, you are likely to have an advantage um, in terms of your carbon uh, rating compared to a gas um, boiler or anyway, a, a fossil fuel uh, supplied building. Just a bit on volume one, there are now three parameters that we need to comply with, it used to be two, and there is a new parameter which is um, a, a parameter for the primary energy rate. So um, this is a parameter that's influenced both by your fabric and also by your fuel. <clears throat> uh, so a couple of key changes in addition to the ones I mentioned earlier. Uh, as I said, there is a new metric, the primary energy factor. There are uh, photovoltaics panel on the roof of the notional building and the notional building also has wastewater heat recovery in uh, um, in his um, showers so it's a system that allows you to recover heat from the wastewater mostly from your showers and baths uh, and feed it into the cold water into the same or other <clears throat> showers in the dwelling um, and also the there is an emphasis, so in London, you're asked to connect, if possible, to a heating um, network. But if the ne network is existing, then your actual building will have a, will use the same parameters as the notional. So the notional will actually match you, uh, which makes it quite hard to improve onto the notional um, if the, you're connect connecting to an existing heat network. So we've been modeling a few projects and early lessons learned is that because the notional dwelling has a gas boiler, if you use heat pumps, you are likely to, um, to it's gonna, likely to be quite straightforward to pass uh, the two parameters that relate to the carbon emissions and the primary energy. It is more complicated now to pass the fabric efficiency parameter, as was mentioned before as well. Also, the wastewater heat recovery is actually significant in terms of absolute numbers um, and um, especially if you have like a hotel or a um, care home or those uses where there is quite high um, hot water load it makes quite a big difference to have the wastewater heat recovery. This is just a slide summarizing kind of the fabric changes into the um, old and new um, notional dwelling specification. It's, uh, it's, it's quite a tight uh, <laughs> specification, quite demanding your values. And it's also showing you've got the wastewater heat recovery and the PV system, and also the lighting has become more efficient in the notional. Volume two, uh, there's only two parameters here, this carbon emission and energy rating. There isn't a fabric efficiency rating in this case. And also by modeling, we've found that uh, in this case, contrary to volume one, um, the notional doesn't have automatically a gas boiler. It will match whatever system um, your actual building uses. So just by having a heat pump, you don't get an easy win uh, because also the notional not only will also use a heat pump, but also the um, seasonal efficiency um, of the notional are really high, especially cooling seasonal efficiency of 5.5 is really hard to match in reality. So the notional will most likely beat you <laughs> in in terms of the um, energy, uh, primary energy here. Uh, so other early lessons learned, uh, if anyone has done the uh, modeling, they know the auxiliary energy is tricky. It's hard sometimes to understand exactly where the numbers come from. And because of limitations in the NCM uh, methodology for modeling, um, it's sometimes difficult to match the notional. Um, sometimes the system you're actually using don't even exist or you have to approximate when you're modeling them. Also, before the lighting in the notional used to be um, uh, 60 lumens per watt. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I think I should have been watched. Anyway, um, the um, it it used to be quite like a like almost how do you say something out of jail card where you could 
kind of match the notion along the other systems and just use very efficient lighting and you, it, it would give you uh, the saving you needed to pass. But now, because the notional's lighting efficiency has gone up, it's become uh, quite difficult to to do any better. Um, so just touching on, as I mentioned, I do a lot of projects in London, so this is a bit London uh, bias, but in London now, the London plan hasn't changed, still asks you at the stage that they call be lean um, to do 10% better than part L just by using energy efficiency and fabric um, efficiency measures. Uh, they also ask you then to investigate connecting to a district heating network, and then they ask you to maximize uh, renewables um, and, and photovoltaic panel on the roof. And they ask you in total to achieve 30% um, improvement over Partel just by on-site um, measures. So because the notional is getting better and better and better, improving it by 35% is getting harder and harder. And this is just a very quick example of a project we are working on at the moment, uh, kind of um, submitting planning soon. It's a school and 146 dwellings um, in London. So I'm just gonna talk about the dwellings side of things. Um, you can see on the left kind of the, the U values we've started with. Um, they are pretty demanding, almost passive house. Uh, the, what is not passive house is their permeability, which is was initially quite standard. Thermal bridging are quite good. Um, we used uh, quite a good value and we initially didn't have wastewater heat recovery. And you can see that we didn't achieve the 10% saving over Partel. So what we did then is we've changed the windows to triple glazing, we improved the air permeability, and we also added wastewater heat recovery throughout, and that allowed us to um, to finally get to that 11% which we needed. Also, you can see the big green stage is the renewable stage, because the notional has PVs. Um, you might you, you see we don't really get a lot of saving from that stage because you're comparing your PV your photovoltaic panel system with the notionals one. So a um, couple of findings, as I mentioned, it's really pushing you towards passive house levels of fabric and their permeability to manage to improve over the partel requirements. Wastewater heat recovery is significant. It really made the difference between being below and above the 10%. Um, also the notional has the PVs, as I mentioned, photovoltaics. And so you could even end up with negative big green savings if you can't have a big enough array on your roof to match the notional. And uh, again, a mention of the thermal bridging penalty, which is really significant if you don't uh, um, consider it early enough. And then just a final consideration is that um, when modeling, especially all the, the building services, um, there's two parallel things going on. One thing is you, think about a design and you think in your head it's going to be super low energy and efficient and then you go and model it in Partel and it doesn't pass or vice versa <clears throat> you have a design that passes Partel but then in reality is not as low energy as you think so it's really important throughout the design to keep in mind both uh, to keep your eyes on both don't go on designing without looking for Partel compliance, but at the same time, don't just think about compliance, um, but also think about what is really energy efficient. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you all for listening. And I'm going to pass um, over to Claire. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me just get my screen set up. It's going to be full screen for me. Okay, so um, hi, my name's Claire Young. I work for Civic Engineers, so we're civil and structural engineers based across the UK, so London, Manchester, Glasgow and Leeds. Um, I'm also based in London. And um, I just wanted to start, um, just so you know, my screen is over here, so if I look that way, it's because I'm trying to look at the uh, <laughs> camera, but my screen's over here. So. Um, so I wanted to start by sharing this graphic that we developed internally to try and capture where we want to stand as a company. So at this point of intersection between the natural environment and the built environment, 
because we can't really shy away from the fact that we are in development, but we want to work our way towards working with the natural environment and creating this sort of cohesive space that has limited to positive impacts on the natural environment and the people who are living in our cities. So obviously as structural and civil engineers, we have slightly less um, impact on the embodied carbon, sorry, the operational carbon side of things, which is largely what Part L deals with. So the energy usage of the building over its lifetime after it's been constructed. But the principles of retrofitting and adapting for the most low carbon and sustainable outcomes um, are really a key part of our everyday design. So um, I just wanted to take you through that. Um, and also highlight where we do overlap with um, some of the stuff set out in Part L. So how do we impact um, the operational um, sort of energy usage of the building and structural engineers? So firstly, obviously, we work with the architects on things like air tightness. Thermal bridging has already been mentioned quite a few times. And I'd like to echo the fact that it's really important to make sure that the details are designed and followed through in construction as they were intended in the original structural design. So often thermal bridge um, connections have to carry both structural load and also act as a thermal um, bridge prevention. <laughs> um, so uh, that's a really important part of the design to sort of get uh, fully coordinated across the design team. Um, then we also want to avoid too many different materials. So this, if you're familiar with sort of passive house design um, kind of things, then the more structural materials you bring into your design, the more complex your detailing is going to be, the more different types of thermal bridging are likely to sort of arise. So um, when we're setting out what materials we want to use and how that materiality is going to work, then we want to make sure that we're trying to limit the number of different types that we're working through. Um, and as a slight side note, because this, this fits into the um, in-use side of the embodied carbon of the structure, um, it's really important to um, allow for the lifespan of the elements that you're using. So if your building is intended for 50 to 100 years, where it's being adapted and retrofitted for a further 50, 100 years of life, then you need to make sure that the uh, materials that you're using, the products that you're using, are also spec for that lifespan, or if they're not, that they can easily be removed and replaced um, and recycled um, to sort of optimize the amount of circular economy that you're putting into the design. So that's just a very structural specific one. Um, on the right here, um, we have an example from um, Barcelona, actually. These are the ICTA offices. Um, which I just think is a really fantastic example of really early stage coordination between the structural engineers, the architects and tent and the MEP engineers. So they put um, ducts in the slab to lighten the slab and reduce its carbon content. Um, so similar to using sort of hollow core slabs or similar, but these were sort of put in in situ. And so they had a lot of control over the duct routing. Um, and then these ducts were also used um, for MEP sort of moving air about and transfer of services and stuff. So. Um, I just wanted to advocate and highlight for early coordination between MEP and structural engineers. Um, often it's sort of something that gets pushed further down the line in our IDA stages. I'm sure you're all um, familiar with that. But things like where the services openings are going to be, um, plant loading. Um, we've already mentioned PV covering roofs, but we also want to consider where we're having, we will have blue and green roof requirements. Um, to out in things like the London plan. So it's getting these things to be able to share space and also making sure that as structural engineers we're allowing for sufficient load um, capacity in the, in the design and in the um, adaptive designs as well at, early on in the process. So um, <laughs> conservation of energy and carbon is obviously absolutely vital to keep global emissions down. Um, and a massive amount of UK's carbon emissions are created by the construction industry. About 10% of the UK's emissions are directly associated with construction. Um, and embodied carbon will be responsible for almost half of total new construction emissions between now and 2050. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that a really empowering statement because it means that we can have such a positive impact. Oh, I don't know why my screen was this, but there we go. We can have such a positive impact um, on this issue as an industry. We have sort of the power <laughs> to do that. Um, so obviously the most efficient way to cut carbon costs and conserve energy um, 
uh, is to stop building, but obviously we can't do that, um, or at least not totally. But what we can do is take the existing buildings that we have, um, have acquired from our predecessors and sort of reuse them, repurpose them, bring them up to date, um, make them fit for function and make them energy efficient, which is obviously what part L is geared towards. So internally, we've come up with this uh, little graphic, which I realise doesn't quite work in the same way as the triangle, but it's moving past this sort of 20th century quality cost time triangle and embedding carbon, um, both embodied operational all the way to whole life carbon um, as a constraint. So making it sort of a really core pillar, it's not something that we can really opt in or out of anymore, um, as people used to think they could. So it really needs to form a sort of early pillar of your of your design. So I just want to take you through a couple of examples um, from, from a structural engineering perspective of um, fabric upgrades and changes to design. So this is Plymouth Marjon University. Um, this is in um, Plymouth, as the name would suggest, and they've actually developed a net zero carbon plan for their entire campus, which is sort of completely overarching everything from where they source their energy, um, improving sort of active travel for the campus, but also uh, relevant to this presentation, upgrading their buildings. So they have this extensive um, set of building stock from the 1970s. And um, they, as you can see, are sort of these big um, RC frames. And I just wanted to point out that to enable the architect to sort of set out their vision in terms of how they wanted to strip back these buildings, reclad them, there's a lot we can do as structural engineers to enable that. So finding the historic information, understanding obviously which parts are structural, which parts are not, where you can adapt, where you can add additional stories um, and add value in that process. Um, and the sort of capacity the existing structure has for those changes to the loads in terms of facade and insulation and um, spotting potential sort of thermal bridging problems and the like. Um, and then some more practical recent examples, um, Park Hill, Sheffield is one of our projects. Some of you might recognise it from Doctor Who <laughs> if you're fans, because um, it's the home of the uh, current companion Yasmin. Um, so this is, um, a sort of council housing estate in Sheffield. And you can see this is sort of the original state. And in phase one, so it's been done in, in a variety of different phases. Phase one, um, we looked at stripping the building back to its original frame. So we kept only the original concrete frame and the core walls. And then it was completely reclad, um, new railings put in, new apartment layouts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that was sort of, phase one, which is a really sort of basic look at keeping an existing building and, and upgrading it. But as we've worked through the further phases, we've realized there's more and more we can do to retain as much of the existing structure as possible and reduce the amount of embodied carbon of new structure that's going in, um, while still enabling the architects and the MEP engineers to create an efficient um, design in terms of energy consumption. So you can see for phase two, we've actually managed to keep um, most in all the masonry panels. We've carried a lot more uh, repair works out of the existing concrete. Um, so this is phase two with the sort of existing panels still in place, um, but they still replace the uh, banisters that went um, across the railings. And then we've also got um, phase three, which is currently ongoing, where we're looking at retaining even more of the structure. So you've got the existing concrete um, balustrades have been retained, which it might seem like a small thing, but across an estate of this size, um, keeping all those elements in place and working out from day one, how you can integrate that existing fabric with your proposed fabric to meet those standards, to meet part L, but also to reduce the amount of embodied carbon that you're adding into the structure um, is, is really, really critical. So um, that's everything. I just wanted to flip back really quickly to sort of remind you the reason, the reason I was showing those examples is this graphic here, where we have the operational energy of the building and the embodied carbon is sort of like a traditional um, building that would have been built over the last 50 years or so. And now as we slim down that operational energy um, in accordance with Part L and sort of modern net zero um, design standards, 
then the embodied carbon wedge becomes the defining wedge. So it's just to point out that these things don't have sort of distinct borders. Everything overlaps with every other element of the design, as we all know. And it's really important to keep these things in mind um, and not treat it like a sort of tip boxing exercise. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Claire. I think I'm going to ask everyone else to join me back on the screen, if that's OK. We've got lots of questions. So obviously people were really interested in all your presentations. Hello. Um, uh, lots of the questions were on um, access to slides and also um, access to the webinar for people that join late. That will be made available to all of you at the end. Um, I'm going to dive straight in and let you guys pick up whichever questions you feel you want to answer. Um, one question we had was, would anyone have any thoughts about what might change in the role of electric heating in new homes, given the changes to the SAP calculations? This person's thinking particularly of smaller dwellings. Shall I go for that first? Um, I guess it depends a little bit of how, how small um where you uh i mean ultimately in 2025 part l which just a little bit of a flag the consultation for that is going to be late spring next year so there is work going on on the 25 standards that will go to an electric heating of some form irrespective from that point onwards at this stage you can stay with uh, uh, a gas boiler provided you've got renewables with with it in 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 some form and i think most of the major house builders not all has to be said most of them are going gas boiler still with pv because it's a technology combination they understand um uh, but it is giving them the opportunity to start to put their um toe in the water with regard to uh, the likes of heat pumps um with a with a small property depending on its form uh factor etc it it may be um uh one where the there are a different set of um uh, heat pump options uh, available if it's very low heat heat loss then exhaust air um might work for you uh, provided this is done very well i would emphasize um but certainly you know heat heat pumps absolutely and if you think about it um where we're headed is to an electric heating world so I would encourage people very much to look at the electric options because that means that we have one less retrofit every time you do that uh, around the corner. Um, but I also appreciate sort of commercial realities of us stepping in that direction. Perfect. Can um, I just maybe add uh, something? Course. Yeah, it's it's great that David mentioned this 2025 because um, <clears throat> so I, I think really it's um, it's kind of all a bit about the fabric. So if at the moment, if you have a new build with a really, really good fabric, almost passive house, then an electric electric heating, will, basically your demand for electric heating, if the demand for heating in general will be so low, you could probably get away with direct electric because you're still comparing with a boiler. But when in a couple of years time, uh, the notional will also have an electric um, heating, then your direct electric will really struggle to pass and also just emphasizing what david said i think the electrifying the heat is really the key to the future because the grid um, the more renewables are built the more the grid the electricity grid becomes low carbon up to an, a point maybe in the future where it will virtually be zero carbon uh, because the, all of the electricity that goes into the, if all of the electricity that goes into the grid is generated by renewables, so really, that's the, uh, that's that's the where we should all be trying to get to. And I think there is also the reality of the, of of construction right now, where, um, and it's still possible to do the direct electric, but I think in the future, um, it's gonna penalise you if you have direct electric compared to any form of heat pump that has a much higher efficiency compared to the direct electric system. Thank you. Moving from electric to hydrogen, somebody did ask, are hydrogen ready boilers recognised within the regulations? They said this may be the only option where space is restricted for ASHPs. 
Oh, interesting one. Um, uh, my my understanding is no, um, uh, and the the reason for that is even the government are only making a decision in 2026 on hydrogen, um, uh, and that doesn't say it's going to be available in 2026. It will be, you know, if if they said if they said yes, then it would be probably in the 2030s come available. I just put a little caveat in there, be really careful how much this hydrogen is going to cost people. Um, it's a fantastic fuel, but probably not for heating homes because uh, it's going to be too expensive. And that's just the physics of it's much better to turn it into electricity. Yeah. Even if you had to store it in hydrogen form and then turn it back into electricity and then put it at a heat pump with 300 odd percent efficiency. So um, the question in terms of space, uh, I think there are some really innovative um, uh, solutions around, um, but that may drive you um, towards more energy efficient fabrics. So you drive that um, uh, heat uh, requirement right down, which again opens up your options for um, those uh, uh, heat sources. Thank you. We did have a question regarding fabric as well, regarding the fabric first approach. Does the panel think the new U values are particularly ambitious? <laughs> Maybe I can start. <laughs> um, I, I, think, I think that they are, they are ambitious. I think that we should be ambitious. Um, I think the London plan asking you to improve by 10% over it is becoming maybe overly ambitious. I think we, as Claire mentioned earlier, we need to also think about the embodied carbon. So there will be a point where making, like um, getting to that level, passive house is amazing and uh, as many houses as possible should be passive house, but not every building, not every t type of building uh, also can be passive house, but also um, there is a, kind of a, a balance point to be struck between adding a whole lot of embodied carbon uh, to your building to get a very, very small additional saving because there are massive savings at the beginning of the curve. When you get to a certain point, then the savings in energy use uh, become a lot smaller. So, yeah, I think that's... Um, yeah, and especially I would add to that that you know at the moment if you if you include a lot of embodied carbon in your design, bearing in mind as we've already discussed that the grid should ideally be fully electric and renewable in I mean later sort of 2050 or whatever, um, that for a large proportion of the building's life it won't be um, producing emissions through its operational energy so if you include a lot of early stage embodied carbon now we can't we can't take that back or save it or make it more efficient over time that's already sort of spent so yeah there really is that balancing point and it's important to that's why it's important to consider the whole life carbon and really have all of those numbers next to each other so that you can properly evaluate how your decisions are impacting that it's i think we're reaching a really interesting point um because the performance of homes um, uh, is getting to a point where they're, they're pretty good. They can go further, but it's pretty good. We're currently running a, a, a task group called Refining uh, Future Home Standard 2025, and we've got about 180 people involved in this at the moment. Um, and that is looking at um, uh, actually a series of five contender specifications that range in ambition uh, to flush out the points that Claire and Lydia have been making. Um, Interestingly, as walls get thicker, then obviously uh, developers uh, rightly say from a plotting homes perspective, they'll take more space, they get less onto the land. Um, but actually there is a, a bit of a driver here that will, uh, you know, Claire will be all over, is um, it might lead to more attachment, less detached square homes if they were, became more a uh, proportion of more semi-detached or terraces, then actually you can have your wider walls uh, with your greater energy efficiency, which means you need less net zero power supply being, you know, uh, size well C and wind turbines and things. Yeah, that becomes our limit is how much energy can we 
generate at net zero, but it also saves in terms of uh, embodied carbon if there's more attachment. So um, you there is a sort of a, a, a win-win here, um, and it will be interesting to see how policy navigates that because it's there are some very real issues here. If you retain existing structures, how is the remaining lifespan of these elements determined? People had quite a lot of questions regarding this one. <laughs> um, I mean, fundamentally, obviously from a structural perspective, that's for the structural engineer on the job to sort of determine. Um, and that will come through a whole combination of the uh, amount of existing information that's available. Um, so whether you can access the original drawings, the original design to fully understand that, um, the amount of testing and investigations that you carry out to be able to justify sort of further long life, and then the amount of um, remedial works and retrofitting that you do. Um, and it is entirely individual for every single building that you work on. Unfortunately, there's no sort of like ticks all the boxes answer. Yeah, so um, you you really need to assess each building in its own merit. And we very much have the skills and ability to be able to extend the lives of buildings beyond their original tension. But it's really important to consider that's often necessary. So just because you're sort of recladding your building doesn't mean that the structural frame is suddenly suitable for another sort of new 50 or 70 or 100 year life cycle. So um, all of that needs to be considered at the, the sort of start of the project as well. So you get the sort of scope of interventions um, right um, and included in the budget, etc. Yeah. Um, another one we had was what tools do you recommend using for comparing the technical specifications of products, particularly with regard to embodied carbon? David, um, yeah. <laughs> um, I guess it depends very much here on the products that we're talking about. If we're talking about MEP ones, I'll let uh, Lydia answer that, and David. Um, obviously, from a structural perspective, there are a lot of um, in-body carbon counting tools, um, and it really, really depends on the products as to whether they provide those sort of passport, sort of uh, cradle to gate information about the product. So um, I think that is, um, my understanding, Lydia, is that that's, that's slightly where MEP is sort of lagging behind and that we, we have yeah. a great hands on the sort of modelling of the actual energy usage, but knowing the sort of embodied carbon of the elements that are going into that in the first place is a bit more. Yeah, sort of yeah that is, that's true. Um, this, this kind of passports the EPD for each project. So we're finding that um, it's often really difficult to find them for the <clears throat> building services elements of the building. So there are some companies that are starting to produce them, but it's it's also it's quite a long process and quite expensive to produce one. So um, it's it's just kind of companies are are catching up now with the importance of those of the embodied carbon, and we are really exponentially looking at it more and more. When I started working at Max for them, there wasn't really any mention of embodied carbon. It was all about the energy. But now uh, the focus has really shifted and carbon has become the real metric. So companies are catching up and are starting to produce more and more EPDs. Um, yeah, in terms of the tools, um, there are various tools available, um, modeling software, but I think yeah, the EPDs is really Having the information in the first place is the available is where we should be getting towards. Yeah, and I would say that the um, it's that change in wedge size that I had in that sort of graphic, right? Yeah, we've done an excellent job of slimming that operation. So now we have to focus on the other thing that's now the sort of the big, big, big element. I would say as well, though, to focus the energy, your sort of design energy on where you can have the most impact. So um, sort of gain a really good outline understanding of it's it's not really that useful to sort of do the embodied carbon of every individual duct, but things like PV panels have a lot of environmental impacts that need to be considered. And proportionally, they're gonna be sort of a tiny little grain compared to the embodied carbon of the overall structural elements and architectural sort of plannings and finishes. Um, so really sort of keep those things in sort of proportion in your in your mind yeah, when you're assessing Absolutely. That. And it, it really also changes depending on the type of building. So we're now modeling quite a few offices. So we have 
a reasonably good idea of the worst offenders in offices. There's a lot in the ceilings, a lot in the floor, uh, raised access floors. There, but it really depends on the building type. And I think the more of this modeling we do and the more we will understand really wh where to focus the effort. So uh, some of the more common building types we're starting to gather a lot of data about and um, hopefully with time we get a bigger picture for other buildings, uh, building types as well. Brilliant. And if I could just mention, Future Homes Hub is launching a report uh, shortly on uh, and has been looking at the embodied and whole life carbon uh, uh, of uh, a series of dwellings as examples to get a sense of that scale. And uh, as Claire said, what are the bits you can influence and what are the bits that may be large that are more difficult or uh, not to get too distracted by, you know, the the, the last five ten percent. Um, if you wanted to really make progress, Lydia, just as you've described. Yeah, David. Someone also has asked: Can we have an emailed copy or a, like a hub link or PDF version of the Future Homes Hub? Is that available? Uh, so yeah, it's it's www.futurehomes.org.uk. And that will take you to the main website and the guidance is there. So futurehomes.org.uk. Perfect. Thank you. I thought I'd ask that while it's relevant. Um, are there any changes to ventilation requirements is another one that was quite a popular question. Hmm. <laughs> I, 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 there are changes. There are changes. Uh, there is as I, lo I love David's acronym, the what, PLOS. <laughs> the, there is also changes to part F um which um I've, I've also as part of this whole new set of of regulations i don't actually know the details i think maybe david i don't know if you wanna yeah i can touch on them a, a little bit and kind of uh perhaps indicate where practice seems to be shifting yeah uh because you know the, the the base level is intermittent extract fans and trickle vents and uh research over the last years has kind of shown that actually that doesn't, as homes get uh, more airtight, um, uh, the air permeability reduces, they're not providing great indoor uh, uh, environments. So um, the trickle vent size in that naturally ventilated circumstance has actually doubled. Um, okay. And that's quite significant. Um, and I think certainly a personal worry is that will mean that the 40% of people that close trickle vents anyway are even more likely to close them, which kind of is self-defeating. Um, the trickle vent size, and I'm talking sort of generally, pretty much stays the same if you were to put in distributed mechanical extract fans. So in other words, you know, the same places, bathrooms, but also now in the kitchen that extract um, uh, slowly, continuously all the time, and then boost when lights come on or humidity rises. Um, uh, that is to try to help this uh, situation of indoor air quality as the uh, natural air leakage of the, the home is, is reduced. Uh, critical there is A, they are kept on, and B, the, the door undercuts, um, i.e. you've got your 15 millimeters or whatever it is under your internal doors, otherwise the system again doesn't work, yeah? We shall see what happens for Part L 2025. Um, certainly in the five contender specs, three of them had mechanical extract, uh, mechanical extract ventilation with heat recovery in them. Yeah, not all. And we don't know what 2025 is going to be. But I think there's a big decision for the government, actually, for that uh, consultation and for 2025 uh, about whether we stay with the current regime or there's a step and, and there kind of isn't much in between. You either do it or you don't. Um, so in short, some changes definitely look at these documents, um, but there are bigger changes in part O and part L. And I will emphasize part O again. I haven't had any questions on part O. I appreciate it's a part L conference, uh, but um don't get caught on part o you you heard it here first if you haven't heard it before <laughs> thank you very much um we had a lot of questions on trickle vents actually so i'm glad we covered that uh do you <laughs> think, 
Um, I'm trying to filter through. There are a lot of questions. Are heat pumps really the way to go, given the number of external units which will appear on the side of any large projects? Are we building issues for future going down this road? Well, I think, sorry, I'll start, but I, I saw David smiling. So <laughs> um, I think at the moment, the answer is yes. It's just in terms of the availability of the technology. It's already available. It's to scale. It's um, like reasonably in terms of cost and and uh, there are various types of heat pumps um so in in a bill for example you can use a heat pump to do your um your hot water rather than your heating because the more i think as we mentioned earlier the more your fabric becomes really good uh the lower the space heating demand uh, we're seeing now in in flats for example in london you could have a space heating demand of two kilowatts and the hot water demand of 40. So <clears throat> you could choose to use your heat pump to produce the hot water. And um, and there are various types, as I think David earlier mentioned, the exhaust air heat pumps, where you actually don't even have an outdoor uh, element to it. And um, there, there's the technology is constantly evolving. And I think from our point of view, the answer would be yes for now, because it's available and it's uh, already at scale and um it's um it's it's really the the way to electrify your heat um that you can do soon and it's gonna um need less retrofitting in the next couple of years and i i guess i would add um look we've got 29 existing million existing homes yeah that a vast majority have to get off gas um you know, heat heat pumps is uh, they're much obviously lower efficiency, even if they've been improved in most circumstances. Yeah, the heat pump technology is an amazing technology um, because of its efficiencies, and we all have two or three heat pumps in our house anyway, being the fridge and the freezer and what have you. Yes, we need to get our heads around how do we design with outside units in. Uh, in that design uh, uh, architecture thinking, um, and we need to adapt to that. Um, uh, but you know, I've got I'm always amazingly um, amazed and impressed by how clever designs can become, and I wish I could think that way. Um, uh, and I have to say, when I was first doing heat pumps a few years ago, they were horrible looking units as well, very industrial, and I had a bit of a argument with a few heat pump manufacturers saying, I've got this beautiful house that I've just spent an enormous amount of money on and you've stuck that in the back garden. You know, we can do better than that. And some of them now are, um, but I also accept the question, it is something different in the garden, yeah? I don't like my bins either, yeah? But I've kind of got used to those um, and we can, I'm sure, do better with a heat pump. And it's, I guess, going that that sort of carbon quadrant that I showed in my slides of just really considering it as a fundamental core component that obviously if you if there's a different option for your site that's going to give you the same energy efficiency, feel free to go for that. But um, it, if you consider these things from the very first point of design and you're not trying to sort of shoehorn them in later and going, oh, well, it's messing up all our plans. It can't mess up your plans if it's originally part of them and it's part of the original design intent. Um, and it's not something that you can sort of choose to omit for aesthetic reasons or choose to omit for cost reasons. You just need to build that in in from the start. Um, and unfortunately, there's there's no way getting around that. We've been doing that for the last sort of 10, 20 years, sort of pretending that it's not a problem, but that, that really isn't an option. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've got time for another question. What are the risks to the grid if we all go for all electric? I've had experience with the grid not having enough capacity locally for us to drive electric solutions. Yeah, um, it's a very good question. I think um, in in the long, so the, the issue with the grid, not so much is the total load, is the peak load that's connected to it that the grid needs to be able to sustain. So in a way, kind of the future probably is being able to have energy electricity storage that will help shifting that peak. So if you could store some, for example, you have your panel, your photovoltaic panels, you store some of that uh, electricity so that you can use it at a later time, maybe in the evening when there isn't 
sun anymore, but you're not then resourcing to the grid because you've stored it. So that's at local kind of um, scale, but it could also be at a more centralized um, centralized scale. It's really uh, about uh, being able to store the electricity and to kind of flatten that peak, which is what makes it um, difficult for the grid to cope. Yeah, and I'd add that the uh, DNOs and uh, uh, developers, etc., are very aware now of, and the planners, we've got a planning group here uh, with this Future Homes 2025 task group as well, of understanding how all these things need to connect, because we do have to reinforce the, the grid. It's it, That has to be phased, so it needs to be focused on the areas of most need. We need to plan where the, to build where the grid is already strong, not where it's immediately needing reinforcing. But yeah, there's a big activity um, that is required to reinforce the grid, but we can limit that and also the generation if we are smart about it. So, um, you know, storage or shifting of demand and new dwellings in particular, um, you know, are pretty energy efficient and depending where it goes in 2025 could be incredibly energy efficient such that you may not even switch your heat on that day, yeah? Um, so hot water wise, you can shift around. I think so there is both the, there are all the elements here. It needs, it's coming together, but we're not quite there yet. And a bit of a, call, you know, plea on the call is the sort of control uh, uh, brains that sit behind controlling all of this stuff. Um, they uh, have a massive opportunity, but, you know, could, uh, uh, could you know someone's going to make a lot of money in that space I feel because there's a great amount of innovation that can take place um, because I think the other bits of the the uh, uh, jigsaw are available it's just not being pulled put together yet and I cannot think in my mind that having a brain in a heat pump and a brain in an inverter and a brain somewhere else makes sense. You need something that is going to connect these things together. And that's a gap at this moment in time. And we will drive change through the changes in design. So, you know, we live in a sort of capitalistic and sort of market based environment. So the more energy that is being demanded and asked for and paid for in terms of the grid, the more the grid will be able to and will then expand and update. So it's sort of a bit of a chicken and egg. They can't just sort of produce a bunch of extra capacity in the hopes that people will use it. Um, but then there's also the planning element side of things where things do sort of change too quickly for the grid to be able to adapt. But it will drive change at the end of the day because people need to we need the power. And they'll, they'll pay for it. <laughs> Absolutely will. And that's where regs are important because that gives uh, investors, manufacturers, designers uh, confidence in markets to come. And I just, if people aren't aware on the call that SAP uh, 10.2 is the version we're at at the moment. It's quite an average one. SAP 11, which is being developed and will be rolled out for uh, 2025, is a half hourly uh, or likely to be based on half hours. So it's much more dynamic. And therefore, these opportunities of load shifting and storage can be recognized within a modeling tool. And we all know how, you know, engineers and house builders and everyone else is in terms of pushing to comply. That will give them another route to consider, which means that it could happen very fast indeed. Brilliant. I'm going to stop us there because we've overrun. But thank you so much. Um, apologies to anyone that sent questions in that we couldn't answer. Um, but that is definitely all we have time for. There will be a survey at the end for everyone if you've got a minute to fill that in. Um, and do join us this afternoon for our final session on net zero in the built environment. Thank you to all our speakers. It was really lovely to hear from you. And thank you to everyone that tuned in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.